Welcome to another installment of the video lecture series for Business Studies. Uh, what we're going to look at today is new product introductions and in this particular session we're going to cover an overview and we're going to try and draw some alignment to some of the wider models that will support concepts of a product introduction. So basically a reinforcement of some of the P of the marketing mix that is product. I, I mean Harris, I'm Degree Scheme Coordinator for Marketing, Digital Marketing at Aberystwyth Business School. Um, so let's see what we've got in store. Realistically, we need to look at product introductions from an overview perspective to recognize that organizations need to either refresh products or introduce new products to maintain market share. This obviously has a direct linkage to the strategic direction of the organization and the way in which they intend to drive their revenue growth over the next five to ten year window. Now in a high tech environment that won't be a five year window, they'll be looking at a two to three year window. Logically this area aligns very closely to the Ansoff matrix from 1957 and the Boston Consulting Group matrix um, of the mid 80s. And what we try to do there is just show how products get um, developed off and through understanding those particular model constructs. We're going to look briefly at the concept of product line and product mix um, changes because that's typically where established organizations expand their market or their product offering. Uh, and then finally in this section we're going to take a look at the concept of red and blue ocean strategy. Red ocean is competitive environments where we try to steal business from existing uh, players in the marketplace. Uh, Blue Oceans where we try to identify novel value for our customers or our potential customers and that means that we don't have to compete head-on uh, in the same way. So that's the content for this particular section. So learning outcomes for this and the next lecture is what the challenges a company needs to address to introduce a new product, outline and critically describe the main stages in developing new market offerings, and describe the best way of managing the process of developing new market offerings. So that last point is going to be dealt with in a separate video that looks at um, the process specifically uh, supportive of new product introductions. I kind of alluded to this at the beginning of this particular session and, and examiners for your level three components would expect to see that you can integrate several elements together. Uh, what we do in the marketing degree is we take all these different concepts and different models uh, and different disciplines within marketing and we seamlessly conjoin them or join them together so that people understand that marketing is a process that is fed in from numerous disciplinary areas within marketing uh, and for you at <clears throat> level three we're just going to try to ensure that you understand what drives um, product introductions and then how, how product introductions are delivered. So we recognize and you recognize that the new product introduction process for level three is fairly uncomplicated and that it should be aligned with other models and concepts so that when you answer questions in your assessments, you can show a much broader understanding of, of this actual process. The marks will become a great deal higher through that distributed understanding of the material. Also, when you think about products, you have to accept that every organization is constrained by its financial resource availability, its human resource availability, so its capabilities and capacity for delivering. And similarly, the sort of historical cultural development of the firm and, and what they're known to be good for. So an example of that really is that there were numerous times in the early 90s to mid 90s to the early noughties that Apple uh, pretty much was very close to closing shop or being taken over or co-partnering with other uh, technolo technology companies because their finances weren't running, um, their resources were being depleted. But fundamentally, their capabilities as a firm meant that they could leverage those to be able to deliver products. And the real turnaround product for, for Apple was certainly the iPod on iTunes net um, framework. So organizations understand that 
basically when we seek to make revenue we either make it by organic growth we grow the number of products that we sell in the market that we sell them to and if that's saturated we enter new markets or we create new products and new markets and we'll be covering bits of that in this particular lecture so we have to either organically grow or develop new products that are attractive so apple at the minute are in the process so this was recorded in february 2020 they're looking to introduce the iPhone SE, um, should be launched in the next two weeks, but because of the, the Wuhan flu, uh, it's likely to be delayed by about six weeks. But what they've recognized is that whilst the iPhone 11 has been probably their most successful phone innovation in the last three or four years, there's part of the market that is under, under capacity for them. So they intend to introduce either the iPhone SE or it may be called the iPhone 9. I don't know, it hasn't been launched yet. And the idea is that that phone will cost about 400 pounds, probably 399 pounds. And um, they're gonna try and tap into the, the market that wants a lower specification iPhone. So they, they don't necessarily want the iPhone technical capabilities. They want the infrastructure and the ecosystem of the iPhone um, iOS and App Store environment. So as well as making revenue through organic growth and development we can also buy um, revenue by acquiring other companies other organizations so apple had a particularly successful itunes mechanism which was driving billions of dollars of revenue and profit every year because basically it was just acting as a as a distributor for the music firms but by the end of 2012, 2013, it was fairly obvious that the concept of MP3s and owning music was being supplanted by uh, streaming music. They had no product that would facilitate because the speed at which the market changed. Apple chose to buy Beats Music and they paid three billion for it and they've rebranded that into Apple Music. And as of the time of uh, recording this, they had about 55 million subscribers paying approximately $10 a month, $120 a year, probably 20 pounds in the UK, but you get the idea. So all of this is part of strategic direction and it's typically covered off you know, by several models. There, there are tens if not dozens of models that cover this particular area. ANSOF is, is a really useful sort of starting point here and basically here's a joint statement of a product line and the corresponding set of missions. The missions or the markets within which they were intended to be delivered is the seminal paper on this area. And basically, it was a very early understanding of the product market strategy. So you'll be aware of what the ANSOF matrix looks like. On the y-axis, it's got existing markets, new markets. On the x-axis, it's got existing products, new products. And you can see that if you've got an existing product in an existing market, what you're trying to do is you're trying to grow the penetration, the number of people using the product in that market or the amount of volume of product being used in that market. Similarly, we could have an existing product that we want to put into a new market. And, and this is there's quite a bit of growth in this area over the last 10 years in marketing. It's called bottom of the pyramid, whereby we take existing products and we may actually dumb them down. We may actually remove facilities or capabilities from the product and then launch them into a less developed market. And this is quite a common thing to do. An example of market development with an existing product was the Morris Oxford um, chain was delivered to India in the, the late 50s, early 60s. And it became something called the Hindustan Ambassador. So you have a 1950s car uh, and the production line for that car being shipped wholesale to um, Hindustan where they created and delivered the Hindustan Ambassador until 2014. Now that product had got to the end of its life cycle in the late 50s, early 60s in the UK. In 2014 it was actually stopped being made in that Indian market. So we can see that you know, market development using existing products is, is distinctly possible. If we look at new products in existing markets, uh, then this is where we're really looking at line and mix extensions. And we're going to cover a bit of this later in this particular session. But a great idea of sort of product development is if you think that in the iPhone 7, Apple removed the headphone jack from its product. Now they did that strategically. They did it because they wanted to launch a new product that they thought was going to be potentially valuable to them. And that product was ultimately the AirPods, the Apple AirPods. 
which in 2020 um, generated about six billion dollars of revenue for Apple. Apple own 74 percent of the wireless headphone world market. So what they've done is they've looked at the existing markets where they sell iPhones or iPads and they've now created a new product, the AirPods, that's generating about six billion dollars annually um, and own 74 percent of the market. Uh, product development in existing markets, again, you can say, well, the Apple Watch is, a, is an existing equivalent, okay? So product development, we're not going to talk about diversification. It's the high risky area where you put a new product in a new market. You know very little about everything in that, in that context. So a quote that really supports this is this concept of innovating. And if we think about sort of creating new products, and the whole point of new product introduction is, is basically innovation, Drucker says if the prime purpose is to create a customer, the business or organization has two and only two functions, marketing and innovation. Marketing and innovation produce results. Everything else is a cost. Now, the point here is that when we think about the Ansoff matrix and we think about the product, the market penetrations, what we're thinking about is marketing or innovating. Um, so there's a very strong association between the Ansoff matrix and new product introduction. So we must recognize that organizations are under environmental threat, competitive threats, and new entrants to market producing products at a lower cost than traditionally is. is been the case. This is the China effect really from the late 90s through to the mid-teens of this particular century. So they introduce new products regularly. Typically these new product introductions follow a very structured development. The structured development we're going to show in the second lecture. To facilitate the development of these new products, um, the organizations typically are using products that are currently in the cash co status. They fund the development of MPIs in established companies. So organizations like Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Nestle, Cadbury's, uh, Kraft, which is now owns Cadbury's, um, they are using products that are generating sustainable, good, solid profit to launch new products. Because those new product launches cost money. They cost money to think about. They cost money to research. They cost money to conceptually develop. They cost money to market test. And then they cost money to promote into the actual delivery into the marketplace. Now, in fast environments, instead of using the cash cow products to fund these MPIs, um, they will do it through direct investment, through angels, corporate financiers, um, people who are willing to risk investment in, in companies that have a good idea but have no market and have no revenue. Um, they're called unicorns in the United Kingdom. A unicorn is an organisation which is worth more than a billion pounds but that has very little sales and basically they are funded by angels or corporate finances. Now for the smaller scale environments, Kickstarter, is an example of where you might raise the cash to build the new product. And if you click that link, it'll be a link to a, um, a Bluetooth device for, um, for an SLR camera. And you'll see that they raised about £1.2 million to productize their stuff. They got the funding to deliver what they wanted. So this obviously is the Boston Consulting Group matrix. And what this looks at is market growth and relative market share. And what we're doing is we're using, in this case, because the way this one's set up, the bottom left-hand corner of cash cows to sort of try to finance the question marks and try to find the future stars. Now, the important thing with this is that it has a high relative market share. The fact that the market growth is low doesn't matter. It's generating revenue. And those dots are showing revenue proportion by by product range. So if this was Kellogg's, they would be different forms of cereals. And certain cereals obviously are losing market share and low market growth, so they'd be a dog. Whereas where we didn't know whether there was a, um, a high market growth with a low market share, it could be a question mark. So the idea here is we're using those cash cows to try and fund the question marks and the stars. And we're trying obviously to divest the dogs because they're otherwise a drain on our revenue. 
And this all fits into the product life cycle. Uh, and again, these are models that you should have seen during your A-level studies. If you haven't seen them yet, you will certainly see them um, at some point soon. And that research and development stage is the new product introduction stage. So if you look at the x-axis, we've got research and development, introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. And what we're looking at here is everything to the left of research and development. So, okay, before we actually launch the product. What we do know is when we launch the product after we introduce it, we hopefully would get growth, maturity and decline. But what we do recognise is that the diffusion of products and services in the marketplace occasionally chasms occur in that diffusion. And this is the chasm diffusion model where the innovators and the early adopters take the product on, they embrace the product, they use the product, but unfortunately the product never gets to the early majority. Now a perfect example of this is the Windows Phone, which some of you may be aware of. If not, look it up on Wikipedia. It was Windows or Microsoft's attempt to enter the smartphone market. Similarly, um, Amazon did exactly the same with the Fire Phone. Fire Phone. And what they did is the innovators and early adopters took the product on, they hit the chasm, the early majority just said, well, actually, I think Android or Apple iOS is a much better solution. I don't see the benefit of this product. And they hit the chasm and they never go any further. So be aware that these models um, support the understanding of the structure and the strategy of these activities. So as I mentioned or alluded to earlier, then product line and product mix extensions are the classical way. The reason is is that if I have an established brand, then it already has a mind share, a heart share in the marketplace. And it means that instead of trying to sort of advise, grab people's perception, uh, help them form an attitude towards a brand, that attitude already exists, behavior towards the brand already exists. So therefore, by extending the product line, what we're doing is increasing market share by rate increasing the range of established products. So the classic case of this is if you have a toothpaste, you start off with a basic toothpaste and then you get a breath freshening toothpaste and then you get a whitening toothpaste and then you get a gum health toothpaste and then you get, you get the idea, okay? And ultimately these go to complete products and the product line is therefore complete. And organizations only introduce these product lines if research shows that they're not going to cannibalize existing parts of their market. So they're not going to lose sales. Or if they're going to gain more sales, then they're going to lose if they introduce the product lines. Another way of doing this would be the product mix. I'm going to use a oral health example for this one as well. But the product mix, diversification of the company into new and existing markets with different offers. So Colgate, for example, was the originator of toothpaste in the 1860s. Um, they've gone through the classical product line extension uh, components where they've started articulating the breath freshening, the whitening, the gum health, the sensitivity, the all-in-ones, and to increase the amount of revenue they get from established markets, what they do is they will introduce mouthwashes, toothbrushes, toothpicks. You get the idea, okay? Now, there's a great deal of work in this area because obviously organizations want to know what what leads to a successful product launch. One of my PhD students currently is looking at the impact of innovation in the product life cycle, which we're going to cover soon. Um, and this is a great article from Schneider and Hall from 2011. And it looks at why most product launches fail. And it's a really accessible, um, really accessible article from the Harvard Business Review and, and the Harvard Business Review is a very light and easy to assimilate sort of journal paper. Again, if you can remember Schneider and Hall 2011 and the question comes up on this area, it's a very good reference for you to use that will impress your examiners. Launching completely new products then is not easy. And if you think about how long it's taken uh, Apple to establish the Apple Watch, it's currently at Series 5. Uh, there was a big jump between Series 1 and Series 3 in what the product does, and then more incremental improvements between 4 and 5. On the bottom right-hand corner, we can see an example of the Series 5. So completely innovative new products are fairly rare. Now, the bottom line is that Apple is using Red Ocean strategy to deliver this to market. And, and the revenue generated by the Apple Watch now is higher 
than the prestige watch market globally. So they now are a market leader in, in watch sales by, by value in the world. And the reason that launching these completely new products is, is quite rare is that we can't really understand what will make them work. And typically we don't have sufficient market insights or possibly even deep enough pockets as organizations to be able to fund and communicate the development and delivery of the product into the marketplace. And what we mean by these reproducible basis for estimated market insights is what should we be doing with pricing? When Apple first released the iPhone, sorry, the Apple Phone Series 1, it was incredibly expensive for what it delivered. Now, to be frank, um, the Apple Watch 5, which my son asked for for Christmas, is still incredibly expensive, but there's a little bit more to it and it's more established. It's, it's entering the early majority phase, so people understand apps are being developed and it's, it's delivering the right user experience. So the benefits that, that the Apple Watch offers over a traditional watch are are significant but the bottom line is that a watch really is required to tell the time that's it everything else is kind of an augmented element of the product so when we think about how we would segment target position the apple watch then we, we have a challenge so I'll give you an example tag hire have now introduced their own android wearable watch device it uses a tag hire bracelet and an interchangeable watch face so that it can switch out um, watches. They sell those for about two and a half thousand pounds because obviously Tag Heuer is a, a prestige watch brand. But companies are doing this left, right and centre. Tesco is the market leader for grocery in the UK, about 27-28% market share. Um, there's a huge growth in, in veganism, veganuary, I think there was about 540,000 people. Uh, when I last looked had signed up to joined Veganuary in January. Uh, we're anticipating that there will be a million new vegans in the UK by the end of 2020. And what they're trying to do with their product lines is they're trying to introduce um, additional plant-based meals. They've got a very good range called the Wicked Kitchen. Um, what they're trying to do now is they're trying to go after a slightly different part of the market with a different range. Um, one of my group, one of my modules is actually exploring a product introduction for Sainsbury's in the vegan space. So we can see that we're actually exploring these contemporary issues in real time. So in dynamic environments, some of the problems that we have with is in how to deliver um, this new products is that technology might be uncertain. The market might be uncertain. So China as a market to enter in 2000 was a fairly certain market, but it was a bit like the Wild West. Currently trying to enter the Chinese market where the Chinese producers are starting to gain more local market share is a great deal less certain. Competitive volatility always exists. Procter & Gamble and Unilever are always having some sort of fight because they both offer washing up liquid. They both offer sort of oral health products, they both offer um, washing powders, they both offer, you get the idea. Typically, some, sometimes there's high investment costs um, and we obviously have short product life cycles. So some of the typical problems that we have are, are basically, you know, it costs too much to actually deliver the product to the market. So if you think about Procter & Gamble or Unilever trying to deliver washing powder in, in rural northeast Brazil where there's very few metal roads, most roads are mud um, or dirt roads. How do you distribute to a product of 50 million people who have very, very low living standards and therefore wouldn't buy a box of washing powder? They'd only buy a single-use sachet of washing powder a week. So these environments cause problems for new product introduction. So why don't new products constantly cannibalize the market? Well, okay, there's a shortage of ideas, but I'll give you an opportunity now to have a think about one or two others. Okay, so you've had a little bit of time. Fragmented markets. 
how do we actually get the product to the market? And the example of Northeast Brazil is a distinctly fragmented market. Clusters of population that basically are semi-autonomous. They live themselves and they have local producers and suppliers of products because regionally they don't deliver products or services across the across the government. Um, social and government constraints. Well, let's look at social constraints. Socially, driving a Skoda 30 years ago um, was not a particularly good activity. One of the jokes of the time is what you call a Skoda with two exhaust pipes, a wheelbarrow. Um, the bottom line is that socially you have to overcome the accepted social norms to be able to introduce a product. So when Apple starts going into the watch market and selling watches which cost the same as Longines and Tag Heuer and Omega, the market's a very different social construct. So it's a very difficult thing to achieve. Cost of development. Well, if you think there's only really two major airplane manufacturers, Boeing and Airbus, um, both are being accused of sharp practices and collusion to maintain their market share because to, to develop a new jet series is incredibly expensive and therefore new products aren't necessarily going to enter. Capital shortages. At the minute, as of, of, as of delivering this, Laura Ashley, a teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Laura Ashley is a very famous 60s fashion brand, um, moved heavily into ladies' fashion and homewares. And to try and increase their revenue, what they've been trying to do is they've been trying to do the Laura Ashley tea room. So they're moving into the service space. But even they're needing to have capital shore ups because they just don't have enough money to roll out the Laura Ashley tea room concept. Um, so that tea room, more difficult to do. Shorter, pro shorter product life cycles. Apple typically iterated its phone on a major cycle once every two years. So it would launch the six, 12 months later it would be the 6S. 24 months after the launch of the six, you'd have the seven. Samsung for the S10 was launched on the 19th of February, 2019. They have just launched the S20 series in, I think it was early February, 2020. So we can see that there are all sorts of challenges that organizations have to circumvent to be able to deliver this. So just a quick note, um, all universities that you think about studying at will allow you to take entrance examinations. Aberystwyth University has an entrance examination. They have distinct benefits. You can earn yourself unconditional reduced offers for the business school and whichever degree that you're applying for in watch whatever university you're applying for. Um, importantly, there are some large financial awards. And actually, it's very important um, because basically um, employers, especially the senior, the significant senior graduate employers, actually look at whether people have got uh, entrance examination results which are positive. If you'd like to find out more about the ABBA Uni entrance examination, just voice search ABBA Uni entrance exam. At the minute, we're doing two entrance exams a year. Um, so you've got two opportunities, January and June, to apply for those entrance examinations. So when we think about new product success, um, often it's the case of incremental innovation. Um, so the iPhone 7 to 7S is a classical case of incremental innovation. It occurs where firms gradually improve the core benefits or where they port the product or service to a new environmental need. Uh, and this is kind of where that sort of bottom of the pyramid thing I, I mentioned earlier comes in. Um, we're, we're porting, delivering, modifying the product or service to a new environmental need. You know. So what is the need of detergent in northeast Brazil? Okay. So beneficial because already have a good understanding of market dynamics, have an understanding of competitive resources, and should have the consumer insights to, to be able to work things. So if you think about this, Costa basically is the number one, um, is the market leader for coffee shops in the United Kingdom. They recognised that they couldn't really penetrate many more sort of high streets, so they started then moving to large government organisations and started moving into hospitals. Pretty soon, those typical market spaces also sort of got denuded and they couldn't move any further. So incrementally, how did they increase their distribution, their place 
offer is they started putting cost of machines into garages, forecourts, anywhere basically that had a supply of water. Um, and that's an incremental innovation. Similarly, you'll see this concept for um, superstores. So uh, Morrison's, Sainsbury's, Marks and Spencer's are putting food outlets in spaces that you wouldn't normally associate. So Marks and Spencer's or, or Waitrose or Sainsbury's food, you can see in lots of service stations on the, on the, the motorway uh, network in the United Kingdom. So we accept that we can incrementally innovate and it mitigates the the risk of what we're trying to achieve. Another example from a product perspective is if you think about the new Ford Fiesta motor car, that was launched in 2018. In 2019, the Ford Fiesta Active was launched to market. The difference was about a centimeter in ride height and some guardrails and some sort of uh, wheel arch defenders. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to capture the sort of light SUV market with a product that had been modified or incrementally innovated at a very light level. Strangely enough, they're doing that now for the Focus and they will also be doing it for further cars up their line, which are traditional cars. Uh, the bottom line is, is it particularly successful? If you look at the market value of those active versus the normal cars, they tend to be a little bit less. So it suggests that the market is not particularly happy with that innovation. So earlier we, we talked about the concept of Red Ocean. And, and the bottom line is that Apple runs around with about $250 billion of cash reserves. That's not assets, that's just cash assets. And what they do with these assets is they use them to dominate existing markets. So Apple has maintained its, its way in the last 13 years or so since the iPhone was existed. Even though it's losing market share, it's in, introducing new concepts, changing the market dynamics and driving very, very significant and decent revenues and profitability from them. The idea with Red Ocean is that you introduce new products that are better, or possibly in some cases worse than established, and you win by leveraging the overarching brand awareness and recognition. Uh, so the bottom line is you're using the strength of your brand to push out lower level competitors, even if they're market leaders. And you see this in the fitness band market, where you know basically Apple are tr basically trying to leverage out most of the Fitbit and the Garmin sort of and the fuel band Nike products, uh, which don't exist anymore, the, the latter, um, basically because they're providing a, a better solution. And they can go through five iterations of a product before they start generating suitable, decent revenue. So ultimately, Red Ocean competition means that they have more financial reserves or, or deeper pockets, and they can just bludgeon people into submission. And here's a prime example of this. This is a screen grab from yesterday talking about the River Seven floods. Um, the Times is owned by the Murdoch Group. The Murdoch Group runs Sky Television. Sky Television is a staggeringly profitable organisation. Typically it generates about £750 per customer per year in profit. So it can use the profits from Sky TV to put a paywall on the Times to maintain quality journalism and basically to bankroll the Times. Otherwise, the Times would be competing in an environment that was pure Red Ocean. They would have to fight on a, on a level playing field. As it is, they use cash from Murdoch's other profitable empires to shore up and maintain the Times' position. If you compare that with the Telegraph, and some of you might be reading the Times Telegraph, the Independent and the Guardian, and uh, if you compare that with the Telegraph, it's a very different proposition. The Telegraph subscription cost is considerably less than the Times subscription cost, not because the content is better, because the Telegraph has to compete on price, whereas the Times can just say, we'll just take a loss because we're, we're supported. To head on compete, often competitors will create disruptive innovations that are cheaper to produce but offer the same core benefits. So British Telecom owned um, a mobile operator, I believe it was called O2. They then sold it um, in the late noughties. Uh, and more recently, they bought everything everywhere. I think they bought that in 2017. So why would British Telecom own a mobile telephony company, sell it, and then rebuy a market leader for much, much more than they sold O2 for. 
Well, the answer is really simple. What they realized is that their current business is very, very dependent on fixed line internet. And fixed line internet is going to be attacked quite heavily very soon by 5G mobile internet. 5G mobile internet is quicker than any fibre network provided in the UK, even the Virgin dedicated networks. So they had to purchase everything everywhere, EE. They had no other option because what they knew is that they would be competing on a, um, on a red ocean basis. And if they didn't have a mobile provider with 5G network capabilities, they would lose a fundamental driver of their business. Often a unique superior product will win a category, other times better marketing, better environments may be sufficient. So it's not guaranteed that Red Ocean wins, but more often than not, Red Ocean wins if you're a large corporation. So in 2004, uh, Chan Kim and Mabon um, brought up the concept of Blue Ocean Strategy. And the idea behind Blue Ocean Strategy was innovation. It was saying, OK, how would you innovate products and services so that the market that you're trying to embrace is unexplored and therefore underutilized by competition. So they systematically create and capture blue oceans through a set of tools. Uh, and the Nintendo Wii is a prime example of blue ocean thinking. Uh, at the time that the Wii was released, you had the um, Microsoft product, you had the Sony product, so I think it's the Xbox One at the time. I think it was the PlayStation 3. I might be wrong. That's a long time ago. They were powerful, heavily graphic intensive, very expensive machines to make because they were trying to deliver uh, the ultimate technical experience. And what we did is just said, actually, we don't think the market wants that. So instead of entering the computational speed process and arms race with the Xbox and the PlayStation, they changed. And the core target wasn't young people, predominantly male, because at the time there were less young female gamers, to family members, young and old. And I remember playing um, playing some Wii games with 70-plus-year-old people that would have never sat down and played Red Dead Redemption with me. And all the games supplied where they make all the money from heavy graphics, intensive, immersive, hyper real environments to environments akin to technology from the 1990s. So it was about the usability and the experience of the game. So what I'd like you to do is just think about maybe some of the services that you've used or your family's used in the last few months or even a few years and see if you can identify blue ocean strategy anywhere. There's some obvious ones if you think about an alternative to a taxi or an alternative to a hotel. They're classic examples of blue ocean strategy. Okay, so that should give you time to think. What I'm going to do and how I'm going to end this particular session is I'm going to take you through an example of, of what happens with blue ocean and then sort of just to reiterate some some causes of product introduction, new product introduction failure. So if you think about Netflix, Netflix started off um, in 1999, introduces a monthly subscription concept. Instead of going to the local blockbuster or equivalent in town, driving there, parking, walking to the, the store, trying to find the product that you want to watch, the film that you want to watch or the game that you want to play. What they said is, we'll take that away from you and what we'll do is we'll use the internet for you to order DVDs and we'll deliver them through the post. So in the UK, we had an equivalent called Love Film, which uh, Amazon bought and is now part of Amazon Prime Video. Um, so you can see that what happened in the US for Netflix also happened in the US and the UK for Amazon. So by 2003, it reaches 1 million subscribers. So four years, it, it captures 1 million subscribers, which is a fairly good result at that time. By 2007, delivers 1 billion DVDs. So at this point, they're sending 1 billion DVDs through the mail every year to probably 30, 35 million subscribers. Now, that's high cost and quite low margin. And obviously, streaming starts becoming a, possi a possible possibility. Um, Hulu, for example, gets gets sort of launched and isn't particularly successful first round. And Netflix decide to start instant streaming services. And they start buying content from the established film companies, Paramount, Disney, you name it, um, to actually deliver product. Now, as soon as 
a competitor, Red Ocean enters the market, all of a sudden the cost for buying that content starts increasing. So by 2013, Netflix actually took a strategic direction change. And they said, actually, we don't necessarily want to be distributed. The brand is fantastic. People associate us with uh, online entertainment, particularly films and series. We're going to start producing content. And so they started with the House of Cards. Since 2013, what, what Netflix has become is a media production company. They raise money to produce content. They sell that content via their Netflix service, and they then redistribute it to other um, online service providers. So this is blue ocean thinking. In 2007, 2008, they saw there was a new technological capability. They decided that they were going to move into electronic distribution of content. Within five years, they start recognizing that the competitive environment is going to be quite strong here. So therefore, they move into media production company because to run all these services, the fundamental need is media. And if you're producing media, you actually own the copyright and intellectual property. As you know, Apple has relaunched its Apple TV. It's been playing with this space for the last seven or eight years. It's just launched it quite aggressively now with a multi-billion pound launch. Um, not a problem to Netflix any longer because Netflix actually produces media. So we'll finish off then with some sort of some causes of, of product introduction failure. So often we'll get organizational issues. We're trying to diversify or create new products or new markets where there's a poor fit with culture. So if I'm a university, I'm used to recruiting uh, a great deal of UK 18 year old students. And the organization then says, right, our target market is China, Pakistan, the United Arab Emirates and Nigeria. The culture of the organization isn't necessarily aligned with the objective of the product innovation. OK, so that's a poor cultural fit. Lack of organizational support can, you know, when when. Netflix is moving from delivering DVDs, which is very much a physical distribution mechanism, to an electronic distribution mechanism. The, the skills and capabilities, capacities of their team, the organization to support that needs to fundamentally change. The talent needs to change. No integrated venture team. What that really means is that there's nobody wholly responsible for delivering successful return on investment. You can have environmental failure, you introduce something where the regulations are mapped. And the reason that there's a child in a hammock on the right hand side is that that product was launched in the US in the, in the early noughties was an incredible um, failure. Because at that time in the US, as a child fell out of the hammock, because obviously they were swinging in the hammock and broke arms, legs, limbs and occasionally backs and necks, uh, they were sued. Um, now, that picture was taken from a Chinese supplier of children's hammocks and the Chinese aren't particularly worried about being sued by the American audience. So that product is very, very available in the US at the minute. Obviously, you can have macroeconomic. A classic case of product introduction and macroeconomic is you can see that the minute um, companies, uh, especially airlines, um, are struggling with what they're going to do with all the flights to certain parts of the world that are starting to show um, pandemic activities for the Wuhan flu. So that's an environmental failure. And if I was Flybe, which is currently teetering on the brink of, of failure, then they're, again, they're going to get a revenue crunch because less people will be traveling because there's a higher risk. So some other reasons that my product introduction, my innovation would fail, uh, not sufficient to reach the mass market. When I get to the chasm, um, I can't make the early majority aware in sufficient numbers to offset the cost of my marketing. Or my product is really undifferentiated. You know, when you think about it, how is an iPhone 8 different to a Motorola Moto G7 Pro? There's no real difference, but Apple has a brand differentiation and an ecosystem differentiation from Android and Motorola. The, the phones are equally powerful, have equally good image sensors. And marketing might not meet, meet customer needs. You know, lots of, 
lots of um, products fail because they don't meet customer needs. A prime example of this is uh, McDonald's spent about $180 million trying to create a sophisticated burger called the Muck Arch. And the Muck Arch was, was basically targeted at sort of middle class people because that wasn't the typical audience for McDonald's. But it didn't really meet the customer needs. And typical customers of McDonald's weren't really interested in the Muck Arch. They just wanted the Big Mac. So marketing and the, the intelligence gathered uh, suggested that there was a customer in need, but there wasn't. Uh, the classic uh, new Coke debacle from 1985 is another example where the specification of the product was fundamentally changed, didn't meet the customer needs. Financial support, company runs out of money, um, or possibly the products don't return on investment. And the paper that I showed you from the HBR um, talks about this, this sort of payback timing. Sometimes we can be too early or too late. Um, too early, the night fuel ban was probably two or three years ahead of its time and it wasn't established. The market wasn't established enough for the product to really take hand. By the time it did get established, Garmin and in particular uh, Fitbit were much more contemporary, much more appropriate, much more in tune with what the market wanted. And sometimes you just get technical issues. Bad design did not work. The reason that Skoda's had a really bad reputation in the 80s is basically they were a bad design and they really did not work. Okay, so that's it for the introduction to this innovation new product side. Uh, what we're going to do in the next session is take you through the new product introduction process, which is a seven or eight stage model, uh, depending on which one you look at. We're going to be looking at, I think, the seven process model. And I hope you found that useful. And um, thank you very much for listening.